Well, thank you for coming. And um, I'm going to do a little counting here to make sure we have everybody here. That's a related joke. My job is to warm up the audience. You're doing a great job. So thanks, thank you for putting on this uh, forum on the census. Um, as I was just saying before, it's, um, it's, when you start talking about the census to anybody, their eyes really roll back in their head. <laughs> their head. So find you know, three colleagues that um, also think about the census is exciting. Um, so I, um, I teach history, and um, so... Um, and I um, really um, study, I'm looking at one census in particular, um, but I talk about the, the history of the census um, in uh, my classes. So I'm going to just give you a little brief um, introduction to um, uh, the census and, and then tell you a little bit about the one census that I know something about. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues um, here to talk about more contemporary issues. Um, so as all of you, um, I'm sure, know, um, the uh, census is part of our, uh, it's written into the Constitution. Um, in Article 1, Section 2 um, of the Constitution that sets up, uh, uh, the, uh, sets up Congress, both houses of Congress, um, there is um, a, uh, um, is it working? Yeah, there we go. Um, in the, in the Article One, Section Two of the um, Constitution that sets up um, Congress, uh, is where um, we find uh, the the uh, wording in the Constitution that says that we are to conduct a census every uh, ten years, and and it's up here for you. Um, Right, in, in which it says, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. All of those clauses probably are ringing some bells in your head um, about the, 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 right, the sort of moment in time when we... Uh, when the Constitution is passed and the, uh, the, the state of, of um, the country at the time about how they were going to count people and for what purpose. So this is Article 1, Section 2. Um, it also says in here, and, it's, and, and you'll note this language is pretty broad, uh, not giving a whole lot of specifics. Um, uh, here, um, if you read a little further down in that same paragraph, it says the actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of 10 years in such manner as, that as, as they, shall be, they shall by law direct, I think. They shall be? I think it's by law direct. I think I probably um, typed that wrong. Um, so this is sort of, you know, recognizing, um, right, that, there, that, that, that this is how it's going to work, but not giving a whole lot of direction about how it's going to happen, except that it's going to happen every uh, 10 years. Um, and also noting that when uh, the Constitution was ratified, right, that, the, um, that they were going to need to figure out some other way to, um, to do this um, until, the first, until the first census could be conducted. A couple more things about Article 1, Section 1 of uh, the Constitution, which we find uh, the wording that authorizes the census. Um, it defined because there, was, there were going to be a few years right before the first census would be conducted. It, con conducted, uh, it, defined, a, it defined a temporary house apportionment, so that both the house, the, the, um, uh, the census was going to be directly related to the number of representatives that each state was going to have in the House of Representatives. So before there could be an official count, they set up a, uh, a temporary House apportionment until they could have an official count of how many people lived in each of uh, the then existing states. And um, also in the paragraph of uh, the Constitution, it, it linked taxation um, to House representation to avoid fraud. So these, so in the wording in which it talks about the, um, uh, the census, it says, right, that uh, the, the numbers of people uh, that are reported for each state are going to be tied both to representation in the House of Representatives and also to 
the uh, burden of taxation that will fall on that state. And the idea here was that they were going to prevent fraudulent counting, either undercounting or overcounting, right? So a state would have a strong disincentive to, to overcount in order to um, pad their representation in the House of Representatives because then they would also have to pay more taxes. So they built into the system an anticipation that there would be fraud, uh, which is interesting and interesting. Um, and, of course, right, that has been one of the most contentious issues about the census, right, from the beginning, uh, right, was that your representation in the House of Representatives was based on, um, on how many people were counted in your state. Census results from the beginning um, have always produced controversy um, and arguments and questions about their validity. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to that. Uh, they're always, uh, they always produce, um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of conversation, a lot of questioning of the outcome and the, pro and the process. I'm going to give you just a few examples of some of my favorite censuses. <laughs> um, and you'll note they stop in 1870 because I really don't know anything that happens after that. Yeah. Um, all right, so a few of my favorites. The 1840 census, uh, which was the sixth census conducted under the Constitution. Uh, that census um, uh, notoriously collected, uh, oh, that's not the only census that did it, but this collected uh, data on insanity and this, uh, and ill-defined, as, as often were these categories. Um, this census was then used by uh, pro-slavery advocates um, in the midst of this conversation, this heating up conversation about slavery in the country. Uh, uh, to argue that there were higher, or, or what they found in the census is there were higher rates of insanity among free African American, the free African American population in the North, right? Using that as proof positive of why slavery was a, was a, a better institution for African Americans, because clearly once they went free, they went crazy. And they even said stuff like, you know, it's not just that it's really cold in Massachusetts, it's that, right, that, that, that African Americans can't handle uh, freedom um, is the argument that people made from, uh, with the results of the 1840 census. Here's just a couple of examples of how people use the census data from the 1840 census in the midst of this um, ongoing argument about uh, slavery. Uh, Mississippi congressman contrasted what he said when he saw the results of the census, the happy, well-fed, healthy, and moral condition of Southern slaves with the degraded, with the miserable victims and degraded free blacks of the North. Uh, this is what the, uh, the, the census showed to this congressman. Uh, and then, of course, Secretary of State uh, John C. Calhoun quoted the findings of this census in negotiations with Great Britain over Texas, over the status of Texas. So this was folded into a conversation um, about Texas uh, and about uh, Calhoun invoked the census um, results to suggest that, right, that, that slavery was this institution that uh, should be protected for the, for the benefit of all. Another one of my favorites, um, the 1850 census, the seventh census. Uh, that census um, was uh, controversial because it was the first attempt made by enumerators to actually collect data from enslaved people versus just collecting the data from enslavers. So, so enslaved people were, were uh, in some cases, asked to provide some information to the, um, to the census marshals in the 1850 census, which created all sorts of panic and, and overreaction um, in the slave states about what that meant. And then the 1860 census um, was, um, uh, the results of the 1860 census were uh, just being published when the Civil War began. Um, so uh, they were already out of date because they were producing data on states that were no longer in the Union. They had already seceded. And all of the data from the 1860 census then fell into the hands of the federal government. Uh, and was used um, effectively uh, toward the end of the Civil War. Um, the United States government used the data very effectively to sort of come up with a, uh, a good strategy for um, a, a sort of bringing the Confederacy to its knees. For instance, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman used maps of the uh, enslaved population of the South as he um, mapped his uh, route through um, uh, Georgia and the Carolinas. Um, to find counties where there would be high populations of enslaved people to create the most sort of disruption to the system of slavery by guaranteeing that these people would run away. 
So he's using maps from the census uh, in uh, the midst of the war. Um, um, there are lots of um, evidence from newspapers and magazines of the, during the 19th century that people um, like to make fun of the census and its results. Here's an example from uh, an 1851 Harper's New Monthly uh, where uh, this woman, I don't know if you can read this um, here, um, but she's making fun of her uh, dissipated husband or, or distracted husband here where she says, you know, um, uh, upon my word, Mr. Uh, Pewitt, is this the way you fill out your census paper? So you call yourself the head of the family? Do you and me a female? Uh, and then um, 1860, um, Saturday evening post, uh, census marshal uh, is trying to ca gather information about, uh, he says in here, I just want to know how many of these is deaf, dumb, blind, and sick. Likewise, how many convicts are in this family? What, what are all your ages are, especially the old women and young ladies, and how many dollars the old gentleman is worth? Complaining about the sort of intrusiveness of these questions and how these people sort of show up in your home and ask all sorts of invasive questions. And the 1870 census is portrayed very differently and actually sort of positively here in this picture, um, in which it's sort of um, suggesting in this image that what they're trying to project. Um, here in Harper's Weekly with the 1870 census is kind of a gap, you know, that, that the census is really going to bring people together in a way, and that was sort of aspirational for the federal government in 1870. You know, they could just count everybody throughout the country, particularly in those just reconstructed states of the South, and maybe they could put the whole nation back together by counting them. And you can kind of see that represented in this picture here where you have, yeah, you know, white people, African-American people, young, old, poor, um, wealthy, represented in this uh, image here in the 18, about the 1870 census. It's probably not going to be a surprise to you to discover that this didn't happen in the 1870 census at all. It was a really bad count. It failed um, uh, pretty terribly. And just in closing, I'll just give you a, a couple of uh, reasons why um, the 1870 census um, failed. Well, most obvious is that the country really wasn't back together so much in 1870. That was aspirational. And certainly, um, if you sort of looked at the tally of, of, of states that had uh, seceded and those that had, had been reconstructed, reconstructed, you might think that the country had, had been knitted back together. But once the census enumerators um, hit the roads and the streets of the country, they discovered something very different, that there were a lot of, of resistance still to sort of con considering oneself part of this nation. So aspirationally, the census was an attempt in 1870 to sort of knit everybody back together. But what it actually showed that there were very deep divisions still in the country. Uh, and there was gross under-enumeration, particularly in the post-war South. Uh, probably over a million people were, under, were not counted in the post-war South in 1870. Um, and mo many of them uh, were uh, freed slaves. Um, formerly enslaved people. And of course, there's lots more to this census, but if you remember that first, one of those first slides, um, right, when, when, when the census was first, um, you know, written into the Constitution, the, the Three-Fifths Compromise was still part of that Constitution, right? And every enslaved person would count only as three-fifths of a person uh, for all the enumerations up until this enumeration. So there was a lot of anticipation for what this census would produce now that each person would be counted fully as a person. Um, but in fact, um, what happened is a, a lot of messiness on, on the ground, and, and a lot of these enslaved, formerly enslaved people, uh, went under enumerated. Um, and um, just sort of quickly to, to give you an indication of one reason why this kind of got mixed up and things didn't go well on the ground um, is um, because there were mixed intentions at the top about what the, the um, 1870 census would do. Uh, so this is going to sound a little familiar to you, but remember we're talking about the 1870 census and not the 2020 census. So there's a Republican administration, um, uh, and uh, that administration was really interested in, um, in using the census. They were um, overseeing Reconstruction. So they were interested in using the census to enforce the 14th Amendment. And uh, so they sought in the 1870 census um, uh, to collect some data that they could um, use to enforce the 14th Amendment. 
The 15th Amendment was winding its way toward ratification, so it wasn't quite ratified yet when we uh, started the census. Um, but uh, uh, they thought that they could use the census to gather some data that could, that could be used to enforce the 14th Amendment. Now, the 14th Amendment's second clause also says, right, that voting rights, that, that every man over the age of 21 has the right to vote. It says that in the 14th Amendment. Not in those exact terms, right? But it says that that, um, that states can be punished for disfranchising men over the age of 21. So when they came, when they were drafting the census uh, schedules, uh, congressmen at the very last minute decided they wanted to add a couple of new questions um, to the schedule, and so they added um, questions number 19 and 20 to the schedule. Um, and if you can see, number 19 asks people who are uh, filling out the census or enumerators to ask people whether uh, the person is a man, a uh, U.S. citizen, uh, 21 years of age or over. This is direct quoting from the 14th Amendment. And then number 20 says whether or not that person has been stripped of his right to vote for purposes other than uh, participation in the rebellion which is what the 14th Amendment says as well. So these were lifted straight from the 14th Amendment and plucked onto the census uh, schedule at the very last minute. Um, this was controversial, um, and um, but it was, in, in, in the end, intended to actually collect data on voter disfranchisement. It really was trying to do that as opposed to a sort of shell game that we've been playing in the 20th. 20 census. Um, uh, so there was an attempt on the ground to, to collect this data and to use the census to enforce the 14th Amendment. Uh, this created um, some other problems locally on the ground and, and likely also helped to, um, uh, to, to um, inform the under enumeration. Um, so, right, so sort of these were um, last minute attempts to do, I think, something right, something good. Um, but in, in the end, it didn't benefit uh, the, the Republican Party thought this was a great way to get um, black men to vote. And of course, black men in the South would vote Republican. Um, but in the end, it didn't quite work the way they wanted to. This sort of last minute census shenanigans. And um, even though they were sort of white minded shenanigans, they didn't quite work uh, the way they All right, so that's. Brief introduction of the first nine censuses. <laughs> so much for coming. I am Camille Burge. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science, where I study political psychology and racial and ethnic politics. And so today I just want to talk a bit about examining the race, the race and ethnicity categories um, on the United States Census. And so to pick up where Judy left off, we conduct the census uh, because the framers of the Constitution of the United States chose population to be the basis for sharing political power, not wealth, uh, not land, but population. And so the census aims to count the entire population of our country uh, and at the location where each person usually lives. So when I teach my race and ethnicity class uh, here on campus, I always do a segment on the United States Census and thinking about how racial categories have changed, uh, what that means for who can and can't be members of certain groups, especially as this pertains to like current day race relations, uh, legislative processes and thinking especially about Supreme Court rulings. So I definitely wouldn't be a teacher unless I had an outline uh, for my 10 minutes. So we'll begin by talking about why we measure race in the United States Census, how the United States Census Bureau actually defines race and the racial categories that we have, um, how we've measured race and ethnicity in the census over time, uh, and why we should care about these measures, especially in 2020, as we have the census coming up. So some of the reasons why, and these are screen grabs from the United States Census Bureau, uh, how the census benefits your community, why do we do this? In particular, it's for the redistribution of wealth, uh, as well as for reapportionment purposes. So redistricting, drawing lines uh, in states to define the various electoral districts. And I think this number coming up for 2020 is about the distribution of 690 
uh, billion dollars throughout the United States. So here's the census's reason for collecting information on race. Uh, information on race is required for many federal programs and is critical in making policy decisions, particularly for civil rights. States use these data to meet legislative redistricting principles. Race data are also used to promote equal employment opportunities and to assess racial disparities in health and environmental risks. So they say. Um, so what is race? That is, how does the United States Census define race? And so what's really interesting about this is once we get to the second paragraph, they make this statement about race being a social and political construct, right? That it's not something that they're defining uh, based on genetics or biology or anthropologically. Uh, they're talking about race being a social construct, these racial groups that people are attached to being more social in nature uh, than anything else. And so the Office of Management and Budget requires five minimum categories, white, black, or African-American, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. So here are the actual racial categories that we have on the United States Census. So I want you to take one minute with your neighbor, and just one, uh, to think about or to look at these categories to talk about them, and then we'll reconvene and we'll talk. So think about what these categories are saying, white, black, or African-American. Uh, look at them, talk about them with your neighbors for a minute, then we'll come back. Don't all jump at once. Just turn around and talk to your neighbor. You can do this, I promise. My students can do it. Well, one of the things I have is my students. And that's true. Kind of limited. Right? All right, your minute is up. It's up. Thank you for actually complying. You know, thirty seconds after. Yeah, okay. So, what are some things that you notice? What are some things? What did you speak to your neighbor about? Way more racial yes. mix. Than well, there's no like mix. Um, so, so, like for me, I would have to choose which one I identify with the most. Good. Even though I'm half and half. Good. There's no mix category. Other things. <laughs> It's defining it, by, it's saying it's a social construct, but it's defining each of the examples by geographic location. Yes, good. We're saying it's a social construct, we're actually defining these categories by geographic location. Other things? Yes. Who gets to define um, what someone is? I mean, do you self-define that, or does a, a, a census taker define it for you? This has changed over time. So it used to be that enumerators were writing down what people actually were. Um, we get this change of self-identification. In my notes, I believe it's in the 1940 or 1950 census, around that time, where people are actually allowed to self-identify, right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that would be highly problematic if you're sitting in front of someone and you're trying to figure out what they are and you incorrectly identify them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Other things. No one talked about the white category? All of my students usually out about the white category. They're like, Middle Eastern and North African, how? <laughs> um, we talked about it. You talked about it? Okay, so this comes from a 1909 court case in California. Uh, George Shisham was trying to become a United States citizen. And so during his case, they were arguing, he's a Syrian Lebanese immigrant, they were arguing that he's of the Chinese and Mongolian race. And so his retort uh, to the California Supreme Court was that if I am of Chinese and Mongolian race, then Jesus is as well. And so the California court said, you're right, you're white. And so this is <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. It's, it's, it's true. It's this gone. established a precedent um, for counting Middle Easterners and North Africans as white in the United States Census from 1909 that we have not yet uh, reversed. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> It works so well because we're at a Catholic school, right? Like you can, you can, okay, anyways. All right. Um, so the 1997, okay. So the 1997 Office of Management and Budget Standards uh, permit the reporting of one or more 
racist. So going back to your comment that you just made, um, before the 2000 census, people had to, people were allowed to self-identify. They could only mark one box. But post-1997 uh, and revising directive number 15 from the office of, from the, from the OMB, you can actually mark two races. So that led to a whole other series of problems uh, as well. I have a lot of time, so I have to read So when we're talking about these racial and ethnic categories, uh, one of the things that's also changed about the census is the Hispanic origin identifier, right? The Hispanic origin uh, and race identifiers. So when we're talking about race and ethnicity, they're drawing distinct concepts, especially for Hispanic people. So we'll see over time in two seconds when I breeze through how the census has changed when we get the addition of the Hispanic identifier on the census because it wasn't always there. <laughs> so how did we get here? Great. Starting in 1790. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so when we're thinking about how the census has changed uh, over time, the thing I want you to keep in mind is that these changes in the United States Census, how we're counting individuals, are also occurring alongside Supreme Court cases. So defining who can and can be white, defining who can and cannot be uh, black. So six Supreme Court cases, uh, as well as legislation that we're seeing in the United States Congress, is helping us produce these categories that are there. Okay, a little over. So from 1790 uh, to 1840, we get federal marshals conducting the United States Census, as Judy mentioned. What I think is really interesting, going back this far, when you're talking about the 1850s census, we're thinking about scientific racism and the rise of scientific racism, things like phrenology, the study of skull sizes, uh, talking about personal characteristics and especially uh, eugenics. What's fascinating here for 1850, it's one of the first times we get the mulatto category. So even though anti-misogenation laws were in place, so there's no race mixing that's legally allowed, the United States government thought that it was important to recognize that blacks and Indians, as well as blacks and whites, were indeed having relations and having children. So we get a mulatto category or a mixed race category um, in 1850. In 1890, you can see how we start getting more gradation. So white, black, mulatto, quadroon, one-fourth black, octoroon, one-eighth black. Uh, we also get the addition of Japanese or Indian. Uh, in 1870, we get Chinese and Indian. In 1890, uh, we get Japanese added to the census, speeding up to 1930. We get a new Negro category that falls right here under white. Why do we get this category? Um, because when we're thinking about legislation that's being passed at this time, you have a lot of one-drop rule pieces of law that are being passed. So if you have even one drop of Negro blood, you're a Negro. So that's how this was counted. No more mulatto, no more octoroons, no more quadroons. You're just white. Right? And again, this is happening alongside pieces of legislation that are being passed. The 1940 census... 1940 census had the exact same scheme for counting, except, which I think is really important, um, white people or Mexicans were counted as white in the 1940 census. Uh, Mexicans were counted as white in the 1940 census. And this reflects um, some of the effort on the part of Mexican-American leaders who argued that the Mexican-American population should be counted uh, as white. So I'm way out of time over my 10 minutes. Um, let me just tell you what's really important. So how we get to our five categories that we currently have um, is from the OMB's directive number 15. And so what they were saying is that there are too many categories on the United States Census, race and ethnicity categories. It's too much for us to count. Uh, we need to reel this in. And they end up with the four races and one ethnicity that we currently see throughout all of our government documents, when you're applying for college applications, when you're applying for grants, um, even in the ways in which we think about each other, it has impacts on our race relations and our intergroup race relations. We walk away with black, white, American Indian, Asian and Pacific Islander, uh, as well as a Hispanic ethnicity category. The 1980 census was a mess. Um, the 1990 census, was a bit better because this is when we start seeing, especially the Hispanic and Spanish origin question. 
Um, 2000 is when we get the first time, going back to the mixed race comment, that people can mark more than one box. Uh, we also get some more examples of race. The 2010 census doesn't change much from that, except we get more examples of uh, Hispanic or Latino or Spanish origin, as well as thinking about other Asian, more examples here as well. And so for 2020, the racial and ethnic categories are not going to change. They're going to be the exact same as they were in 2010. The Obama administration proposed two changes. Uh, they wanted to reassign Hispanic, Latino, or a Spanish category, Spanish origin to a racial category. They also want to include a new category of Middle Eastern, North African, a MENA category. Um, and the Trump administration basically said no. They didn't respond uh, to the inquiry. So it forced the Census Bureau to retain the race and ethnicity definitions used in the 2010 census. So why should we care? Then I'm out. <laughs> and I'm racist. I apologize. For sniffing at the mic. Um, so why should we care? A few reasons. First, uh, when we're thinking about the United States Census, right, all of these categories, the five that I mentioned, shape how we interact with each other. Right? We, we are categorizing people based on the census categories that are in place. Um, second, and perhaps even more important, there are a great deal of political implications here. Right? So we're talking about redistricting. We're talking about the redistribution of federal funds. We're also thinking about when the United States is supposed to become a majority minority space, right? And so these census projections are at like 2045. By 2045, the United States technically should have a majority of basically all the minorities combined, uh, and white people will be the minority. But if we're counting Middle Easterners and North Africans as part of the white population, we can imagine that this might be a bit skewed, that that number might be a bit off. Right? Um, so thinking about that especially, also just a plug to vote in 2020, um, because when we're deciding uh, redistricting based on the states, there's only eight states that have independent commissions for redistricting. Uh, the other 42 states um, actually have whoever the majority in the House or in that state's chamber is drawing the lines for each state. So you can imagine how race might play a role in that as well. Okay, I'm way over. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. You're so good to me. Thank you so kind. That's okay. You started talking about where I started. I know. I was like, not trying to silly you. No, that's fine. Let's look at Philadelphia for a moment. That's what So, yeah, uh, Dr. Burge outlined the part of what I was going to begin with. It does not have to do with this slide, which is great. You're all going to look at this slide. Wanting to know why I brought it up. Uh, I'm Rory Kramer. I'm an associate professor in sociology here, and my research studies racial inequality. Uh, my dissertation and one theme of that research is about racial segregation in Philadelphia, and another theme that's emerged has been about redistricting and gerrymandering. So I live on the census website uh, when I have free time. Uh, that's my nerdy, happy place. Um, uh, usually angry place because I'm trying to figure out the data wrangle. But uh, I do also want to uh, reiterate the proposal for a MENA category and the proposal to combine the Hispanic, Latinx, and the race categories were based on expertise and years of social scientific effort. It was an anti-science move to not include those. Um, there are other anti-science moves going on as well. The census uh, question, um, social scientists said explicitly, this is going to make the census less accurate. One of the additional problems about making sure the census is, a, is as accurate as possible is that uh, in the 1990s, in debates around the 2000 census, there was a debate about statistical sampling and using that to adjust populations for the sake of apportionment. Right? Because we cannot, it's just not possible, to get 100% of the people in the United States on a single day to all answer the census. It can't be perfect. It is probably the single greatest data collection feat the United States does by far, except maybe NBA analytics. <laughs> but it's, um, it's not perfect, especially amongst hard to capture uh, populations, like people who are homeless or, re or have residential instability of any form. Right? And the census does a lot of work to find those people and to, to count them 
for the state. They deserve representation as much as anyone else, um, but they can't be perfect. And so the argument was to make some statistical adjustments to acknowledge that imprecision. That was shut down in the 1990s. So the census question was going to lead to more people not answering, which would lead to having to hire more enumerators to track them down, because people who don't get answer, we try to find them. Um, and then still more people not answering, and a less accurate census. We need an accurate census because it is simply more ethical, more moral, and for the sake of social science, better. Um, so the short version of what I'm going to focus on within the Y care uh, is on race and inequality, uh, and how census data is both the basis for all of our understanding of the inequalities that we need to continue to, to, to fight against, and also one of the basis for perpetuating those inequalities. Data is as beneficial or as harmful as the people who decide to use it. Um, and so we have used it both for great reasons and for extremely horrible reasons. Um, uh, as uh, Doug Massey and Nancy Denton pointed out, residential segregation, which is what this map is showing, is the structural linchpin of American uh, racial inequality at this point. The overwhelming uh, majority of the types of racial disparities we see in health, in education, in income, in wealth, uh, in uh, experiences with criminal justice can be tied back to where you live. And we know that because we know where you live because of the census. That sounds a lot spookier said out loud than I intended. <laughs> so this is, this is one of my favorite slides to show in my classes. Uh, this is a census dot map produced by uh, demographers at uh, University of Virginia. Um, it was based off of something he, uh, uh, a graph, I think he was a graphic designer. He just thought this would be a cool way to show census data, and they were like, that is a cool way to show it. We're going to show it to everybody now, not just Chicago. Um, so you can look anywhere in the United States and find exactly where everyone lived in 20, or uh, not exactly where everyone lived, one dot for every individual in, tw in 2010. Um, and so this is Philadelphia. The neonish green is black. The blue is white. The red um, is Asian. The orange is Hispanic, which I wish they had talked to better design people because this is both not friendly to people who are colorblind and also hard to determine the orange and yellow unless they're large concentrations. Um, and the brown that you won't see on a Philadelphia map because there aren't enough of them uh, is uh, American, uh, Indian, Native American, multiracial or other. Uh, so there are questions about how to uh, categorize multiracial um, historically in social science work. We kind of taking the one-drop rule knowledge and its effect over history, we effectively one-drop rule to put you into a category uh, for the sake of this aggregate data, traditionally. Um, but I like to show this one because you can see, kind of, you get to see like Bryn Mawr and a couple of the institutions, and, and that's Philadelphia, one of the top 10 most segregated cities in the United States. And we only know that because we have the census data um, to study that. Uh, we are only able to demonstrate that segregation as that structural linchpin of inequality emerged post-1960 uh, at a higher rate than it was um, before the Civil Rights Movement, and that it is a northern and midwestern problem, even more so than where we normally think South. Um, the South didn't have to segregate. They had other ways to socially control people based on race. It was the North that had to do that, and it was the North that did that. So the other aspect of my research that I focus on is on um, what's known as prison gerrymandering. So gerrymandering, really quickly, is the drawing of legislative districts for the sake of ensuring that a certain person or a certain political party will win that election. And within a state, it's drawing all of those districts so that one party will, uh, will win more elections that they would win if, it, if those were randomly drawn. Right? So if, if a state like Pennsylvania is a swing state presidentially, it should logically be a swing state in terms of who controls the legislature as well. But because the Democrats in Pennsylvania live in and around Philadelphia, and if you want to learn more about Delco, you can read, listen to WHYY's The Why apparently tonight about that, um, and Pittsburgh, uh, and Republicans live in suburbs around those areas and also the rural parts of Pennsylvania. That is our voting map. The legislative map cuts Philadelphia up in ways that pack 
Democrats into certain um, certain districts and then give Republicans slim margins to win, meaning that our legislature makes sure that our legislature is Republican, even though Pennsylvania votes majority Democrat for those local, local elections. Um, there is a push now for an independent commission for the 2020 census. There isn't much time for that to get by. I strongly support it. But another aspect of that is this is all relatively new because it was actually court cases in the 1960s that required that legislatures be drawn so that each district had roughly the same number of people in it. Before that, they were either multi-member districts, which were used to make sure that black, uh, black residents had no power in, uh, in local districts. That was a, a case in Memphis. Um, or they were drawn so that one area had 30,000 people and another had 5,000 people. And so the Supreme Court in the 1960s said, nope, it's one person, one vote. Um, and the citizenship question is an attempt to do a small end around around that because it didn't explicitly say everybody counts as one person in this. It just said one person. And the ruling recently about this about, uh, is that maybe actually if you have good data, we'll let you draw it around voters, not people. Philosophically, um, representatives are supposed to represent all the people, not all the voters, but that's a little bit aside, and I only have a minute left, so I'm going to move on to the point that I make that uh, at the same, uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen what's become known as mass or hyper-incarceration. The United States went from having a couple hundred thousand people in prisons or jails or otherwise incarcerated, um, and the movement was towards abolition of, of them, to now 2.2 million. And as that number rose, that meant you could gerrymander based on where a prison or jail is. And so along with Dr. Remster in my department, who is currently teaching, so she can't be here, um, we measured how much that affected Pennsylvania's legislative um, map. Uh, and in, in the short version of that story is there are four districts that are legally only viable because they have prisons in them. If they didn't have prisons and jails in them, they would be legally too small to qualify as a district. There are another four districts, right, because those people have to go somewhere, that if we identify people not as living in their prison, where they're not considered constituents of that local district, but rather where they came from, there are four districts that are now legally too large. So over 100,000 black Philadelphians, by this logic, are being underrepresented in the legislature. About 260,000 total uh, uh, residents are underrepresented in, Pen in Pennsylvania's legislature. And it's two Democrats and two Republicans representing those um, districts with prisons. So this isn't actually partisan. It is racialized. Um, and just as a phys uh, visual reminder of this, that is uh, SCI Phoenix, formerly SCI Greaterford, um, and also the uh, county jail. You can guess where both of those are just by looking at it. Um, and this is District 47, which I like to point out because that includes an ICE facility. Um, and so those will probably be even more packed in 2020 than they were in 2010. Um, and those, they're residents of that district. Um, there is currently a bill, uh, HB 940, to follow New York uh, and uh, New York, Maryland, and I'm blanking on the third one, uh, to count uh, people who are incarcerated as living in what they would consider their home district, their last address before being incarcerated. Um, that's something the census is willing to do for uh, for states if they pay for it, but states can also do it on their own after receiving census data. So these are the forms of inequality that we only can build maps based on and also argue against with good census data. Right, so um, I dealt with computer issues all morning, so uh, I wasn't able to create any slides, but um, we want to get to some of the questions anyway. So one of the things that I do, um, I'm Stephen Strader. I'm an assistant professor of geography and the environment uh, in that department. I primarily focus on, oh, it's on a slideshow. I'll just let it go. It's fine. It's fine. Um, so what, what I primarily do is I tend to focus 
how hazards like natural natural hazards, tornadoes, hurricanes, flooding, how that affects and interacts with society, um, which has become increasingly important in recent years. Um, does anybody know what happened this past week? <coughs> what was the new event? Does anybody know? Anybody hear about it? Tornado in Dallas, yeah. Tornado is a very well-to-do part of Dallas that 60 years ago was roughly open land. It wasn't developed. It wasn't uh, suburbs. I like to tell my students, think about what the areas around Villanova looked like 60, 70 years ago, um, and then we can start seeing some of the concerns you might have with hazards. That tornado that now was going through an open field 60 years ago is going through the heart of suburban areas. So one of the things that we do is we need to understand both how the atmosphere is reacting to climate change, how the atmosphere is naturally uh, producing these events, but also who it's affecting. One of the primary ways that we do that is we look at census data. Um, census data is a very accurate measure um, for, for, from a hazard standpoint. For the type of data that I deal with, it's very accurate. Um, but we might want to estimate, as we're a land manager or some type of researcher, how many people were in the path of that event? How many homes? What was the unemployment rate in that path? What was the types of people? Were they mostly white? Were they non-white? These all tell us about something we like to think about as vulnerability. So what is the susceptibility of people to harm? And one of the things we've learned over the years is that, frankly, um, people are disproportionately affected by these hazard events. And history has shown us that time and time again, events like Hurricane Katrina and Birmingham or Tuscaloosa, Alabama tornadoes in 2011. Those affected disproportionately people that were um, what we would say are, are less well-to-do off. They're, they're typically living in poverty. They're single mothers um, with large families. They're non-white. Um, they're relying heavily on public assistance. That's where this term disaster comes from. It comes from who is being affected, not necessarily the intensity of the event. So it's less about thinking how strong the tornado was, more about who it's affecting. So one of the things we do with census data is we take it, specifically in the Department of Geography and the Environment, is we like to map it. So we take that table data, and with the advent of increasing technology, computers, being able to actually map these things, um, map people the best we can to the smallest possible scale, we can look at how things change over time. So a lot of my research is looking at how society is changing, the last 30, 40 years where we have somewhat decent census data and how hazards are changing. And those two paradigms are changing at different rates and leading to more people being affected by hazards. So um, census data is, is critically important to us figuring out what the future looks like. We live in a world that society is changing at alarming rates. People are moving. Cities are getting bigger. People are leaving rural areas and going to urban areas. There's, there's changing that's going on on the surface of the earth, but at the same time we have an atmosphere above us that's changing quite a bit as well. So we have this intersection of these dynamic processes, and census data allows someone like myself, who's an applied researcher, to investigate that problem. To actually go in and say, what is it going to, what are hurricane, what is sea level rise going to do to Florida residents or New Jersey residents in the next 40, 50 years? That's not a problem that we can say is in, in our future lies for a lot of us, but at least our kids or our grandkids, this is the threat that they're going to face. And one of the ways that the reason we care about the census is if I take a step back, I want the census to be consistent or at least not lose anything so I can look at how those things are changing over time, people, places, who they are, etc. So um, I'm not going to take a lot of time. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for showing up. Um, I'm glad I could be a part of, of this. And I'd be happy to take any questions and pass it off to whoever. Thanks. Great, great minds. Yeah, exactly. Same thing, except I wasn't looking at you. Um, we have questions from the audience. Um, do you also measure um, 
future hazards, like uh, where people live, um, when people who lives in the vicinity of incinerators, refineries, uh, in, the, in the more at-risk environments. Hopefully this will make it easier to hear. Uh, that's a great question. We would love to. Um, from, from my standpoint, from the research that I do, it's much easier actually to model the hazard events like tropical storms or heat waves or cold waves. That, I wouldn't say easier. I mean, it takes a lot of computation. It takes years to run these models. But we're not very good at modeling demographics geospatially. In other words, we're good at measuring, uh, there's two terms in hazard science. There's one that's exposure. That's basically counting up the number of people. We don't care what their makeup is. We just know that it's a person. It's our social security number. It's a number. That's easier to model than to say who we are. Because we all don't live here. We go home. We have our own vulnerabilities. We have our own you know, safety nets. We have our own things that make us vulnerable or more resilient. That's a much harder thing to model because we have to make a lot of assumptions. So we have to make assumptions about what future populations look like, what they might do. We're making strides towards that with big data and looking at these data sets. But we're still in a world right now, or at least from, from the hazard standpoint, where the uncertainty is much larger than anything we can actually come up with. Um, we have you know, looked at that person, that number, not who they are. And one thing that we do know is that if you compare from tornado science, we don't necessarily know what's going to happen with future tornadoes. We think they're going to increase. We think they're going to shift a little bit east. But we're relatively certain that population will continue to grow. So there's going to be more people in the path of those events. So if you look at the equation, which is the tornado plus the person equals disaster, we would expect disasters to increase just based on that number. Now, that doesn't take into account who they are. So we're trying. I think probably in a few decades we'll be there. Um, but it's we can take those historical events in Dallas, like this Monday, look at take that same path, put it over that population in 1950, and see how much worse it was now just based on that urban growth. So we'd, I'd love to do it, but it, that's a sort of a, a loaded question and computational limited. That's a great question. I have to do this. The hard, the natural scientists just said the social sciences are harder. That's on the record. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the things that I do a lot is I work with social scientists. And I work with wind engineers. And I, I always champion the social scientists because there's questions I can answer that are pretty easy, straightforward. How many people are affected? But I have to have the social science element because what controls disaster is who they are. So I tend to work across boundaries. That's the beauty of geographer in me, which is I can work with people that care about how the building was destroyed, and then I care about social scientists who cares about who the person is, and then me who cares about how many people. So it's, it's a team effort, and that's sort of the, the world I like to live in. So yeah, 100%. Uh, interdisciplinary? Yeah. Um, I wonder, do you, have, do you guys do any research on, say, Canada's census? Because their society is a lot more multicultural than ours, and they seem to be more concerned with, you know, with actually championing and, and being and inclusive um, in a lot of parts of Canada. So, I mean, you wouldn't get that. I wouldn't think you would get the white Lebanese thing and the and taking like mulatto off or anything like that. So, is there is there where are we moving that direction? And what what do other people do? try um so as far as i know i'm not a i study american politics i'm not a i'm not a comparativist i have no clue if people are doing research on uh canadian racial and ethnic categories and like what this means in terms of how they count people um i do know of work in the comparative context by melissa nobles who's at mit she wrote a book um called shades of citizenship where she talked about uh, the importance of race and like race making in the United States and also in South America. Um, so I'm sure that someone somewhere is doing this work, right? But I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure what their names are and what they've published. We had a grad student here a few years ago. Her name was Kimberly Tower. Um, she had a Fulbright 
to France. And so she wrote a really great master's thesis because in France, they don't collect race and ethnicity data. And so what she was interested in was like, we know that it's a very diverse uh, area, like throughout, throughout the country, there are very diverse like, areas. So she was like, I want to figure out how I can measure ethnicity in France since they don't, or in race in France since they don't collect this data. So what she did was she made a map of France and based it on like Yelp reviews. So one of the things that she noticed, like types of restaurants, right? And so things that politicians would say are like, there's a lot of kebab shops in that area. <laughs> which is code for like, this is probably a pretty diverse area. So she took language from politicians talking about um, kebab shops and other kinds of restaurants, uh, as well as like Yelp reviews and coded them up to see if she could get an approximation of where these ethnic enclaves actually were, which I thought was really neat in the production of knowledge, but still says nothing about Canada. But just to give you some idea about um, some of the comparative work that's being done about uh, as it pertains to the census and counting people um, with different racial and ethnic backgrounds, at least in political science. Yeah. Do we even know what, like, do they use similar ca categories? Does anyone else use our categories in uh, America? Brazil doesn't, no. Brazil has a whole bunch of, <laughs> it's a, uh, uh, historically, yes. Um, the short version, not really. Um, that, that kind of four in one is an American phenomenon based on the American history of racial inequality. Um, one caveat I want to make, though, is, is actually the United States is far more diverse than Canada and has a, a far more complicated form of that diversity um, because of that history of large-scale enslavement by race, and then as well as a history of annexing part of Mexico, as well as a history of using Asian labor out west. Um, one of the mistakes we make is seeing um, levels of, I, I, let me rephrase that. One of the reasons why we have the unique code and system we have is because the United States actually has more, more of the non-white population um, to the point where Canada's total, what they call visible minority population is smaller than the African American population alone, in terms of a percentage of the population. Um, and so then delineating the specifics like Canada does is a way in which it can seem more multicultural in a way. Um, and the fact that they're not quite as segregated and they don't have the ugliness of our racial history, though they have an ugly racial history of their own, nowhere can escape that fact, um, is, uh, is part of the story as well. I lost my train of thought in that last moment. <laughs> So one thing I keep thinking of is, as you're talking about the interplay of geography and the interplay of populations, is um, so I'm from Texas, and I think of Houston specifically, the flooding, the massive development they've had in the area, how the geography's changed, and how in like. I think there have been 200-year floods in the past three years, and how I, how that might disproportionately affect um, African African Americans and really most of the population there, because I, I believe Houston is one of the most diverse cities in the country. So how, how does the how how can the census be used to address th those sorts of issues? So I can, I can address the first part. Um, does anybody know the motto for Houston? The city motto? It's the city without limits. <laughs> so they've taken that to heart. It's one of the more sprawling cities in the entire country. And they are replacing coastal wetlands and coastal... Essentially, it's, I tell my students, um, you put a sponge on a piece of table, or on a table, and then you put the blank table next to it. If you pour water on the sponge, the sponge soaks up the water. You pour it on the table, it goes runs off. That's essentially what Houston has created. They've replaced the sponge with the table, and there's nowhere for that water to go. So floods are also increasing. There's been recent research that has shown that um, tropical storms, when they make landfall, slow down or stall. That's what we've seen the last two times in Houston. And actually, the year before Harvey, they instituted a program that said, we're going to address this flooding issue, and especially in neighborhoods that are affected repeatedly 
well, they've had two 200 year floods since then. So it's a concern, um, and it's happened a lot in Houston. And one of the things you can see in the census data with Houston specifically is that sprawling outward, that urban flight to the suburbs. Um, so from that end, you can see it. I haven't, I don't have enough knowledge. I haven't directly investigated who those individuals are that are affected. Um, it'd be really, I can tell you historically, think of, I think of New Orleans, the lower ninth ward. The reason that those individuals were put in that position was that was where it flooded. That was the cheapest part of the land. They were naturally pushed into those regions that flooded. And then, of course, when the levee broke in Hurricane Katrina, they were the first ones to be affected. That's not unique to New Orleans. That happens in Hannibal, Missouri, um, where it's majority white populations, but very poor populations. It happens everywhere. And that's that you know, comment that I made, which is people that are living in poverty, those more vulnerable people, disproportionately affected. I would argue probably the same thing as has happened in Houston, um, but I, I haven't investigated it, so. I'll just confirm, it did. It was disproportionately black. <laughs> I would always guess that, too, and, and nine times out of ten, I'd be right. Judy, do you want a question? Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> really down. Thank you. I, I know you were interested in 19th century U.S. history. But no, you looked like you were dozing off. So. <laughs> this actually goes to things that both you and Camille said. So if, if there have always been these changing categories, uh, how, how accurate can we be in drawing kind of historical or longitudinal conclusions about trends? Mm -hmm. Is there only so far back that we can go and, and have confidence that it's reliable? And once we get past the stage where the, the categories, are, they seem to be changing every every uh, census, mm -hmm. and we say something about uh, black history or white history, mm -hmm. and how there's been changes in inequality, changes in poverty, whatever mm -hmm. whatever trend we're interested in. I, really quick, I don't, I don't know much about that, but I, uh, it's, I, I mean, I, I you can stick to the 19th century if you want. But thank you. <laughs> so I I have. Um, I, I, uh, sometimes I do um, an activity with my students where they have to write a history of one family that was separated during slavery. And, and, and you, well, YouTube does this with them too. So YouTube can talk about this even more than I can. And, and, and just in following one person through a couple of censuses, their, they could, their racial category changes just within 10 years, right? Sometimes they... You know, so, so students will get confused when they're supposed to be looking for an African American person, and then that person shows up in the 1880 census as white or something, right? Because that is the enumerator's not asking them, as you said, right? Is not, which I was shocked to find out is not until 1950. You get to self-identify. So these are, you know, so so I, I I just I use that as an opportunity to talk to students about like, would you if you were this person and the enumerator said you were white, would you have what reasons would you have to correct it? And you know, and what, and where, you know, where do, where do you come into that picture? And so, what, what I have found with my limited experience working with the censuses that I work with is that they can't, that they're not at all reliable. You know, at that my, at that at that level, that's what I'll say. Yeah. Um, I agree. Camille, you, yeah. <laughs> that's on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a great point though because yeah. if these categories are constantly changing, then what can we say um, about about individuals uh, who are members of these groups, especially when we're talking about the enumerators identifying people versus self-identification. Um, and just looking back through my notes, so they ended that process in 1950, but it wasn't until the 1960 census that they actually started self-identification. So what I do in my race class is I have a picture of one of my friends named Drew Lytle, who is biracial, but looks literally like he could be anything. More like on the Disney Prince side, like racially. <laughs> and so um, I, I put a slide up with his picture on it, and I'm like, if you're an enumerator, how would you classify this person, right? And my students are like, Latino, uh, Lebanese, and I'm like, nope, he's black and white, you know, like biracial, right? So I, I think it just speaks to the importance of self-identification and what it means for race and also the messiness of race as a social and political construct. And based on that question, like I wouldn't feel very comfortable talking about trends at all um, because unless you're talking about um, like post- 
Directive 15, when we actually get the categories, that'd be the 1980 census, maybe to present day. That's what I'd probably feel the most comfortable with in terms of talking about trends, but any time before then, not so much. Yeah. Before 1970, the 1960 question for Latinx identity was, does this person have a Spanish surname? <laughs> That's not very accurate, right? Um, that was our first attempt at self-identity for that. So there are real problems with trends. There's another problem with trends. Most of the data on segregation isn't at the individual level where you have this problem of how does this person identify and is that consistent? And should we assume that should be consistent? Because if the concepts of race change, then individual identities will change along with those concepts. Um, uh, you can see that with a sharp change after 9-11 in terms of uh, Muslim self-identity and their concept of whether or not they're accepted as American, um, for example. Uh, but then also the neighborhood changes. So usually with segregation, we take a census tract, which is supposed to be between 1,000 and 4,000 4, people roughly, that is their proxy for a neighborhood. Well, who knows if those boundaries are remotely accurate, but then they try to keep them relatively consistent, even as neighborhoods change in our own understanding of it because of gentrification or neglect or just change or disaster strikes or whatever might happen. And so they'll shift the boundaries a little bit. They'll split tracks. They'll do things like this. And so your geographies aren't consistent as well. And so those, those are the types of, of quirky data things that is why PhDs take so long where the data already exists. <laughs> okay. well, I'm going to jump in with a quick plug and a final question. Um, my quick plug is if all of this has made you want to do your own research um, or look at anything about the census, we do have some of those historic census transcripts where you can see the actual names, ages, all that very interesting data. Um, and we also have tools that will let you see some actual um, tabulated data and grapple with these very big questions. Um, and my last question for all of you is heading into the 2020 census. Um, it's been in the news a lot. Things have been changing a lot. What's kind of the big question that you have, the big thing that you want to keep your eye on as we go in? I'm interested to know if this sent this um, citizenship question, even though it's not there, is, will have the effect that it was intended to have. I don't understand. If it's not there, meaning people will still... Be afraid to answer the enumeration. It, it will Even though that they won't be asked. Right, the because they're still concerned about, they'll still be worried about what the census is intended to do. Yeah. I guess, from my standpoint, I'm always curious um, to see how things have changed from the previous census. We just talked about the problems with looking at change. I spent a good deal of my master's work actually figuring out ways to compare census for simple variables like population and homes and and you know there's a lot of ongoing projects looking at the southeast and why so many people died from tornadoes there I'm sort of excited to see that that next census come out so we can see how things have changed um, that's important for me because that, that will improve those models of future change as well I, I was going to ask about if we're going to see uh, Latinx undercount because of the concerns over citizenship, so I get to do the second one too. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> which is, one of the things we didn't talk about, because this is really getting into the weeds of the census data, is there's a proposal to, they are going to start um, doing randomization to protect identities um, with census data, and I am a little bit worried about what that's going to do for micro-level segregation research, and I want to see what that is. So they, they, with, with 10 different tables of data about people, you could conceivably combine all of those 10 tables and identify individuals. So if there's one person who's black and highly educated and has this income and so on and so forth, and you narrow it down and there are only two black people that live in that block, you've basically identified someone's personal information. That's the fear. I want to emphasize that that's a fear. Because it hasn't actually been shown yet. But they're going to start doing 
data randomization where they swap out people, kind of change numbers, so that the overall story is the same, but the individuals aren't identifiable. That's going to make our statistically already complicated work even more complicated. So I'm curious to see what that actually looks like for segregation research. And I'm a little bit worried. So I think the Latinx undercount is interesting. Um, we can definitely expect that to happen. One of the things I fear is in observing is the extent to which more people write other, especially if they're part of that Middle Eastern, North African category, and choose to self-identify, given some of the rhetoric that's been coming from the White House, you go back to your country, things of that nature. I'm also always interested in the census and thinking about immigration. So why is it that we don't have massive immigration reform, and why is it that, especially in places where you would expect um, elected officials like Texas, um, to want to do something about citizenship, why don't they, right? Because in some states, Texas, California, uh, New York especially, and definitely South Florida especially, um, people will lose their seats if we start mm -hmm. counting people based on citizenship mm -hmm. as opposed to it being population-based, right? So there's, there's a really interesting interplay there with like all of this anti-immigrant rhetoric and this desire and this push um, to have more citizens and for people to be actual citizens and if you're not, then you should get out. But on the other side of that, there is this self-interested motivation that, like, but if we got rid of them, how many seats would be lost? Like, how many jobs uh, would be lost? And so there is a motivation, I think, on politicians to say a lot of things, but not actually do a lot of things. So I think uh, looking especially at, at the MENA category, there's not a MENA category, but the extent to which we have more people actually writing in, um, as opposed to taking the box if they're not Eastern or North African, and then also thinking about like politicians and why they choose uh, at least to sit on an immigration issue when they could very well do something about it and the jobs that might be in jeopardy if they if they actually did. Thank you all so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.